Hey folks, Guy Mason here from City on a Hill and uh, I'm feeling great. Uh, the sun's shining, I got coffee here, but even more importantly, I, we get a moment to hang out. Uh, the good friend of mine, senior pastor of Sanctus Church, John Thompson. How you doing, John? Um, I'm good. Good evening from me. Good morning to you. 7.30 night where I am. Uh, John, we were just chatting that, you know, we've, we've had interactions over the years. We've prayed together, spoken at conferences together. Uh, you're just, um, you've just stepped from the pulpit, so to speak, and you're uh, about to head out on sabbatical. Tell us a little bit about Sanctus Church. What are you seeing God doing? How long have you been there? I'd love to hear a bit about your story. Yeah, so I've been on staff for 26 years. I just finished year 26, June 1st. And uh, I actually joined the church when I was 15 years old, unexpectedly, uh, with an encounter mm. with Jesus. I was told to join this community, uh, became the youth pastor, uh, and then became the senior pastor at 30 years old. So I've, um, I've, again, been here for a very long time. I've led the church now through four iterations uh, of its life. So it's been a pretty wild ride. Uh, just like you guys in Australia, we in Canada, we experienced COVID differently than most of the world. Uh, and so very long recovery process, uh, for us. And now I think we're just, uh, catching our stride fully again. And I would just say it's been a massive period of rebuilding before that, as you and I talked in the past, like, um, exp exponential growth in a post-Christian context, you know, mass conversions, uh, we experienced a three year documented revival. And I mean that in the historic sense. And um, mm. and so what was it like leading through a renewal and revival for a period of time, taking a very middle class, um, overly anglicized church, preparing for us to be multicultural, we now have 55 nations, like uh, very similar in your context, except Toronto is actually the most multicultural city in the world. There's over 300 mm. heart languages spoken every single day. So, you know, when you go to London or, or Melbourne or, you know, Hong Kong, LA, it's real multicultural, but here it's like, it's even more so. So leading our church to a full multicultural embraced experience, it's been pretty interesting. So yeah, a lot of good, a lot of bad, a lot of wonderful, a lot of difficult, like all of us would say, who've led more than two minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> you mentioned the word uh, revival and, and renewal, um, you know, for people kind of tuning in, like, could you just unpack that a little bit? Like what, what does that word even mean? Like, what are we talking about? And maybe even just in your own context, what, what are some of the signs that you saw that uh, pointed to that? And Yeah, I, you know, I, I say in a lot of contexts where I speak and lecture, a lot of people that are praying for revival are not praying for a revival. They're actually praying for what a normal church should look like. So revival has nothing <laughs> to do with spiritual gifts. Revival has nothing to do with disciplines, though they're interconnected. Revival is a sovereign decision by God to move from om omnipresence to palpability for a significant mm. uh, period of time. So I think the best um, New Testament passage that helps someone understand the process of sovereign decided revival is the transfiguration, because actually mm. revivals are not brought down. They are sovereignly decided upon. And God always tends to give a promise. If you read re revival history, God always speaks to one person or group of people before he acts and says, I've, I've decided to do this. Would you start praying back what I've decided? And that's what happened in our context, where very unexpectedly, um, the Lord said, I'm going to draw close for a period of time. Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus is going to be the center of it. Um, it is going to get weird. And it was. And and so for three years, we actually led through this. And um, and again, I personally, this is, I don't think the heart of what we'll be talking about today, but like, I've never been the same. I am. Um, mm -hmm. I was so marked by the risen Jesus, so undone by his proximity. Um, yeah, I just, I'm not going to speak much about it. I'll just start crying. Tears are good, brother. Uh, and thankful for, yes, for they are. God's work uh, in your life. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, you, you've written three great books now. Uh, I haven't yet read the third, uh, but you've written Convergence, Deliverance, and Perseverance uh, being the most recent. And I saw that Convergence is getting a, uh, a redo. Uh, so I've, I've read the original. I don't know what's going to come in the, the, the new updated version, but um, great, great material and uh, excellent stuff in uh, helping us think about uh, our faith, uh, helping us think about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, deliverance 
you know, really, really, uh, I was personally intrigued by that. I know you did a deep dive in terms of your own study, but your own formation. But the book itself, is, as I said, is, is seeking to help people grapple with the, the reality of spiritual warfare. And uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the, the inspiration for, for that, that book in particular? Yeah, so um, you mean Deliverance, the second book? That's what you're asking about? Yeah. Yeah, so the Deliverance conversation for me begins years ago where uh, when I was the youth pastor and I was leading, and again, a very anglicized, overly sort of Caucasian church and and very middle class, very wealthy. And and uh, sort of the history of our church was it was very Willow-esque, seeker-sensitive in shades, um, and the funny thing, as as an individual and a guy, you know, I've met before, but like my senior pastor was an entrepreneurial business guy who came to faith and said, I want to help non-Christians become, you know, Christians. And I was like this mm-hmm. mystical, charismatic, Calvinist, contemplative, you know, so I was like the total opposite of him and running this youth ministry alongside of him. Uh, as all that was starting to form, more and more people would walk up to me and say, I don't know why I need to tell you this. But actually, I have these weird things going on. And we never looked for this. I wanted nothing to do with this. That was the weird church down the street that maybe would make it to heaven. We'd hang out there. I'd probably ask them, what the heaven are you doing here? You know, like that was sort of my take, you know. And and systematically, the Lord started bringing people from all different backgrounds who continually were talking about the presence of wickedness, embodied evil. And so we were forced into the conversation because it was real. Is this medical? Is this, you know, biological? Is this organic? Is this genuinely evil? Is some of this weird stuff from the Lord? Or is this, you know, the, the butter chicken I ate last night? Like, sort of, how, how do we even have this conversation? And and so now, 25 plus years later, uh, we've probably had access to under, just under a thousand encounters or cases. And so for 13 or 14 years pastorally, we were trying to help people as more conservative evangelicals, not necessarily functioning charismatics in the full sense back then and and as it was happening wondering i wonder if actually what we're doing if this is okay is this biblical is this right we're seeing Mm -hmm. results and so actually i ended up doing my doctorate in intercultural studies in um in missiology where i actually spent four years studying systematically from genesis 1-2 to revelation 20 then church history then evaluating five models to really work out what's agreed upon, what's not agreed upon, what's extra scriptural, what's in scripture, what can I learn? And found out that about 90% of what we had been doing was biblical and was correct and was normative, and which was reassuring and also discomforting. And so the inspiration of this book was 20 years later, after helping hundreds and hundreds of people, and the vast majority of them, by the way, being Christians, let alone Christian pastors, elders, and teachers, and deacons and missionaries and etc going actually there's very little out there that is uh, robustly theological very practical historically accurate and still telling you how to help people on the ground well and so that's why i wrote it it was out of our years of experience and um yeah i just you know we had 100 pastors at our church last week from brethren baptist pentecostal anglican you fill in the blank all going we're all facing this. What do we do? Mm. And trying to do it well and being orthodox and biblical and yet open enough to the spirit to see people set free. Love it. It's great, John. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying how grounded you are in the scriptures and you know walking us through that and, and seeing this. But also, as you say, it's, it, it's coming from a, a pastor's heart, which is shepherding real people. Uh, in a real and at times complex world, uh, I'm uh, I'm reading uh, the Screw Tape Letters uh, at the moment with uh, one of my sons, and uh, I've always loved, uh, and no doubt uh, it's well, it's quite a famous quote by Lewis. But in his introduction, he says, "There's two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence." The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Where, uh, you know, zooming out a little bit, John, where do you feel the church is today in terms of its leaning? Is it, uh, is it in the kind of the excessive, unhealthy interest? Is it in a state of disbelief? It depends where you are in the global church, genuinely. And, and that's just the truth. Like, 
here's the reality. Many, many, many people who have Western upbringings, even though they've lived through the postmodern revolution, are still empiricists in their thinking. And so the vast majority of people I hang out with, we who defended the authority of scripture do not believe what it actually says. That is the thing that is so shocking to me. And so there's a much, there's significant unbelief. And I, I'm quite tired of, of conservative evangelicals saying things like, well, we don't want to talk about the devil because it gives him too much time. There are 300 references to the devil in the Bible. Spiritual conflict yeah. begins in Genesis 1-2 and ends in Revelation 20. It runs as long as covenant theology, salvation. Like if you look at narrative theology, it's there. So um, this is a real war. We're the only people that actually have the answer to this. Psychologists don't have the answer to this. Educators don't have the answers to this. We're the only ones. So I, I who tend to translate uh, spiritual experiences for conservatives, say there's a lot of unbelief. There's a lot of people who function more like atheists and agnostics than they do biblicists in their worldview on this. That's one side. On the other side, you've got a lot of people who make everything demonic. It's the spirit of ADHD. It's the spirit of cancer. And lots of times it's actually not demonic. I jokingly say when I lecture on this, the devil's probably behind every third bush, a little less than some people want and a little more than other people want. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the truth right. is there's three enemies. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil are our enemies in this fight. And that is spiritual conflict. When I deny myself what I want to do, for a greater love, that spiritual conflict. When I admit that some of my political leanings are actually connected to a world system that are anti-kingdom, that's actually spiritual conflict. And when I deal with embodied evil, the same. So I think in certain parts of the global South, they have a much better awareness than a lot of us in the in the West do on this. But sometimes it can be moved to exaggeration in the West. And this is the traditional West, because where I live, again, there's just millions of amazing immigrants who are bringing vitalization back to the church. But yeah, a lot of people in the West have re recategorized things psychologically and scientifically when they've actually been spiritual. And I've seen multiple Christians uh, recategorize their experiences with the spirit or with the demonic in other terms and dismiss the actual essence of what took place. And it's highly disturbing. Something that's great in your in your book is you you obviously walk through, you know, the Bible in terms of those references and you know the the activity of the evil one in our world. But I love also the the way in which you clearly articulate and, and take us to the scriptures to see Jesus. I, I love this particular quote. You said uh, Jesus did not just enter Satan's kingdom; he invaded, he freed captives, he reclaimed territory. Could you, you know, for those of us who might even be new to the Bible, you know, wrestling with questions about the spiritual realm, could you, uh, or even people who've been Christians for a long time, could you kind of uh, in encourage us in terms of what, what you see in terms of Jesus' ministry in, in, in that spiritual warfare sense? Uh, I want to make sure, and you would say this too, that this is not the only thing Jesus did. <laughs> there are, right. It's a multiplicity of things. Like, but I will say this, like uh, Jesus' birth was an invasion. This is the Christmas card you'll never get, but you should get. Mm -hmm. And if you if you really, really brilliantly want to see Christmas from heaven's view, just read Revelation 12 and read the account of Herod mm -hmm. together. Because Revelation 12 tells you what's happening upstairs, and Herod tells you what's going on downstairs. And so even Jesus' presence was an invasion, because the scriptures are clear pre and post um, a, a resurrection. Th this, this world is owned by the demonic. And so when Jesus enters in, uh, it is threat. And it's just incredible time and time again, how Jesus, when he's tempted, says no, and then begins to set people free uh, from the presence, not only just of sickness, which is one category, but also the demonic. And of course, the ultimate uh, victory that takes place, according to Colossians 2.15, is that on the cross, he made mockery and stripped the principalities and powers of their ultimate authority. And so, you know, if you're checking out Christianity, or you're trying to understand who Jesus is, one of the most amazing things that Jesus did is he set you free from the power of the demonic. And to, to I'll throw this out like a grenade to be controversial so everyone can think later. Everyone on earth is possessed. And let me clarify that very, very quickly. Uh, possession is positional, and sometimes it means presence. So I'm going to say that again. Possessional, possession is positional, and sometimes it means presence. The Bible is actually unequivocal about this, and it makes us very uncomfortable especially as Westerners, um, because it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, uh, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that is found in Christ. And so every non-Christian you know on earth, sincere, kind, faithful, religious, atheistic, they're all positionally owned by the demonic right now. 
First John 3 says the, the whole world is under the power of the evil one. So every human, there is no fence anywhere. There, there is no neutral ground that we all want. Every human being is either possessed, and I don't mean internally, I just mean possessed, owned, either by the kingdom of light or by the kingdom of darkness. And when you realize uh, Ephesians 2 is right, where it says every non-Christian, the nicest person who stands properly in the Starbucks line, who's your best neighbor and acts better than the Christian at your church, is dead in their transgressions, owned in world systems, and owned by the prince of this world. When you realize the ownership's that high, and then you see what Jesus did, oh, the gospel comes alive. Because then you're like, oh mm -hmm. my goodness, when you see the word redemption, you literally go, oh my goodness, Jesus actually bought me out of a slave market for real. Oh my goodness, when Jesus stripped the principalities and powers and let me see the Father through the Spirit, you're like, I actually was not just saved from hell or saved by God from God's wrath. I was literally removed from a cruel master and given one who's love, joy, peace, and patience. I want him all day long. But until you see how bad it is, you'll never see how good it truly is. And the Bible paints a mm. very dark picture of the condition of humanity, not just in sin, but also in ownership to the evil one. That's helpful, John. That's really, really helpful. Could you, to those of us who are you know, now in Christ, uh, secure in Him, how, how are we to think about you know, spiritual warfare? Uh, Christians presumably will come under spiritual attack. Um, we also want to, you know, we want to push back darkness with light. Um, you know, what advice, you know, we, we know, we know that Jesus won the battle on the cross, right? Disarmed the powers of the, but the battle's still, you know, going on. What, what role, what part can we play? What, what should we be looking out for and what should be our response? Yeah. So again, because this is a short podcast, I'm going to say some things and I was going to say, when I do this, pitchforks and light bulbs go off. And I just want to reassure your audience, go after I've done this and take time to think through what I'm about to say, because I'm not just spewing stuff. So don't go on X and call me a heretic yet. Just slow down and think before we get there. Okay. So here's the first thing we all need to understand. Scripturally, there are three categories of conflict. And uh, they three sort of words that will help us. There's oppression, there's possession, and then there's demonization. Those are three very different things. And, and this is for us who are followers in Jesus. Oppression is when the demonic invites us into lawbreaking, when the demonic invite us into trespass. You know, so you're walking down the street, look at that person two more times. You should, you know, uh, go and, and lie over there. So there is a, there's an ongoing invitation by the demonic, not just our own hearts, uh, to get involved in sin. That's real. Possession is positional. Either you're owned by Satan or owned by Christ. That's a positional thing. Now, here's where the controver controversy comes, but it's real. There's a middle category called demonization. And I'm going to try to do this as quick as I can. So... When you see the phrase, if you read English as a first language, you see the phrase, and they were demon-possessed. The, the word possessed, English speakers immediately think of ownership because they, possession in our language means ownership. The problem is in the New Testament, there are five Greek words about ownership. They're never used. Anytime you see they're demon-possessed, it just means they had or they were vexed. So this idea that internal presence equals ownership is not in the New Testament. That's the first thing. The second thing is Paul is explicitly clear in Ephesians that Christians who are elected, called, saved, redeemed, bought, you know, sealed with the Spirit until the day of redemption, Ephesians 1, can, according to Ephesians 4, give a foothold out of habitual sin. And why that's, why that's important is the word foothold is topos. It's T-O-P-O-S. It's used, I think, 93 times in the New Testament. 98.5% of those words are spatial words, meaning room, region, space, place, closet. In other words, it's inside influence without ownership. Mm. This is very, very important because we would all say as more conservative, um, you know, I mean, evangelical in the historic sense, not the political sense, we would say things like, we know that when we sin as Christians, we, the spirit doesn't leave us, but he's grieved. We know that if we are in a world system and we're aware or not aware and we find out it's not of the kingdom, we grieve the spirit. But then people say, but there's no way that a Christian who's sealed with the spirit could ever, ever 
ever have a demonic being within them. Well, that's just unbiblical. Of course, the demonic can be in you, but not on you, because it's not about ownership. It's about presence. And if you read Ephesians 4 carefully, he says, you know, do not let, he uses anger as an example. He uses habitual anger. And he says, look, if you're involved in habitual anger, this becomes a place where the demonic get foothold. And then he says, very quickly, because I think you and I both believe in eternal security theologically. He says, oh, but don't don't forget, do not grieve the spirit whom you are, what? And, until the day of redemption, you're sealed. So Paul explicitly says, you can be upstairs, elected, saved, perfect in God the Father's view because of Christ, sealed until the day of redemption. But if you play with habitual sin, it can become a door-opening event where the demonic access, not oppress you, demonize you, and cause destruction inside, but do not own you. Ananias and Sapphira are literally an example of this. And Luke 13, because again, it's a short podcast and people are already starting to get angry on keyboards. But in Luke 13, even Jesus heals a woman pre-cross, I know. She's the only one called the daughter of Abraham. It's a salvific term. And she has a demonic thing within her. And yet, and yet she's, to use our vernacular, saved. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because... There are millions of Christians who are saved, who are love Jesus, who read their Bibles, but are demonized and don't even know it's a category that can be true. And so since that's true, they're sitting back and they're going, either I'm not a Christian or I just can't beat the sin, and maybe something else is actually taking place. And so in, de in deliverance, I take a lot of time theologically to unpack how that's possible and how to prevent that, and also how to get freedom if you're a Christian, and that's happened to you. Okay, we got this is really, really helpful stuff. Provocative, as you say, it'll get people thinking. Um, uh, just a few follow-up questions. Um, firstly, you, you know, talk about, obviously ent entering into, you know, sin is a way in which we might be opening ourselves up. Uh, what what else? Like, are, are, there, are there things that you know, in your experience, you know, you, you, you've passed a lot of people who've, are, are, there, are there things that we should be wary of as Christians uh, in our life where we could be opening ourselves up? Yeah. So um, in the beginning of deliverance, I do a lot of work on this and, and also in convergence because um, how we, have, we all agree that the scriptures are the ultimate source for faith, life, and practice. There's no, we all agree on that. The question of, um, do I need a chapter and verse for everything becomes an interesting conversation. I will tell you from scriptural conviction, church tradition, and experience where what I have seen. Um, habitual sin can become a door opening event very clearly. Uh, interaction with false religion or false religious practices, 100%. And, and not just false religious practices, but false thinking. You know, Paul, Paul's very clear about, I think, in 1 Timothy 4, where he talks about the doctrine of demons. And so there's, there's a whole conversation we have to have about theological integrity, because actually, if I end up teaching or believing heresy, this can be a coming kind of door opening event, actually for the demonic to show up and influence internally within the church or with a human being. Uh, um, and the third one, not to elevate this, but um, uh, sexual sin is not more or less wicked. It is so. And again, our God invented sex. Sex is wonderful. All, all the good things. Um, but just to declare that, you know, there is a bonding that happens between human beings that is unique and different and fundamentally other from other things. And so I found much of the time when people are sexually involved with other people or or themselves, but through technology, there there is a unique door opening event that takes place. Another thing is familial stuff. And I know that this is hard for some of your audience. For, for most people around the world, they just go like, you guys are just catching up. The vast majority of the world is 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 uh, community first and individual second. Uh, Westerners tend to be more individualistic and then communal, but the scriptures I would say are clear, and so is experience that when when families or tribal communities or ethnic communities invite uh, uh, the demonic into those communities, that that demonic thing has power. And there have been multiple times where we've been praying through and for people where actually what shows up in their life is invoked by community or has been invoked by family, even though they never wanted it or knew about it. So that's absolutely a huge one to talk through. Another one is trauma. And I, you know, I, I just taught a, a graduate level course on this for five days, two weeks ago. And I, I asked my class, is warfare 
And they were like, well, of course not. I said, no, but really, is it fair? And they were like, no. They said, so if I flew right now to the Gaza Strip or Syria or wherever there's conflict and talked to children and asked about the fairness of war, would they say it's fair? And they said, well, of course not. And I said, exactly. And this is why this really matters. Because trauma and abuse becomes a place where the demonic actually gain access, even though the person is a victim. And so it's not fair. It's not right. It's just so. So these are different, I would call, pathways or doorways or moments where the demonic can get into move from oppression to demonization uh, on a regular basis that we've had to help people through. Thank you, John. That's that's very very helpful. How do you how have you gone about trying to discern? You know, we're whole beings, and how how do you go yes. about discerning uh, uh, psychological issues? connected to spiritual issues. I know it's interconnected, but ha- could you perhaps frame that for us? You know, how, how do we know? What, what are you looking for to get a sense that uh, this, is a, this is actually a spiritual demonization or an oppression versus maybe a, a, a psychological issue that someone is, is navigating? Yeah, so we're really careful. We work with doctors and nurses and psychologists on a regular basis. We, we, are, we have a holistic approach, so I'm so glad you even started the conversation that way. Because, you know, um, uh, I, I, like I said, like I, I believe the Bible is the ultimate source for faith, life, and practice. But that doesn't mean I think that all modern psychology and medicine is from the devil. <laughs> no pun intended. There's lots of good out there. So here's basically um, what we do. I mean, there's an extended conversation we could have about how we've processed this in a larger church context and how we evaluate this in system. But I will say that one of the critical things is we always say to someone when they approach us, you know, don't go off your meds. Please come to see your doctor, counselor, you know, and so that is not removed from the process. It's actually enjoined with the process. But one of the critical things is this, and this gets to the other sort of um, can of worms or, or wonder, depending on your perspective, and it's this. If you're not actually empowering your community to know their spiritual gifts, and to support all spiritual gifts, then you're going to be blind in this conversation because the spiritual gift of discernment, for example, is so critical. And mm-hmm. and again, the, it's funny, you know, when we when we have um, part of our process where we help people, is we have this thing called listening prayer. And what we do, as segregated out of the system we lead someone through, is we will have people in a room, and we will people have words of knowledge, for example, discernment, prophecy, etc. And they will sit in a room. They're not told the person's name. They know nothing about them. And they go before the Lord and say, do you want to tell us anything? And literally the Lord will tell us things about an individual. 90 to 95% of it is coherently the same. And that matches what the person has self-disclosed, which is incredible. But the point is, the Lord is showing us stuff in real time. But if you're not empowering the power gifts, you're just blind. And you're going to either fake it or you're going to presume things. And, when, and, and in those listening prayer times... Many times the Holy Spirit's told us it's actually not demonic. He's actually told us it's mental illness. He's actually told us, actually, it's biological. It's not always spiritual. And so the role of gifts in this is incredible. There is patterning you can look for, for sure. But uh, a lot of spiritual conflict is more subtle than we think. It's not just like a movie or nothing. Uh, There's a lot of graduation in this, but I would say discernment specifically is critical. And so... Part of the struggle in this conversation is when people come forward and say, oh, I think I'm demonized. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to read Neil Anderson, which is great. And he sort of gets us down the path a little, but then it's like, but does anyone know what the Holy Spirit's saying? And everyone's like, well, I don't know. And then you're sort of stuck. And that's what was happening in our church for years, where we had not had the courage to empower our people scripturally. We were not cessationists, mm. but we were functionally cessationists. But if you're not a cessationist, yeah. you're not allowed to function like a cessationist. That's you're not allowed to do that. So actually, the conversation that's the real conversation today behind the spiritual conflict conversation is actually how are local churches identifying all 21 gifts in their community? So when this stuff arises, you've already got your team ready. Mm. That's great, John. And I think yeah, for people listening, would highly commend uh, John's book uh, Convergence. Uh, you explore or essentially categorize the, the gifts into kind of word gifts, love gifts, power gifts. And uh, I, I just found that really, really helpful. And I love 
I love what you're, you're sharing, and that is that God has equipped the church um, when it comes to spiritual warfare. He, he's given us these gifts. He, he wants us to know the truth. He wants us to walk in the light. Uh, and I, I personally was challenged by that, both in my, not only leading of the church, but in, in my own walk uh, as, a, as a disciple of Jesus. Um, we're we're going to kind of bring this chat uh there's so much more i'd love to talk with you about and hopefully we can continue the conversation and uh i suppose you know for people who maybe kind of finish with this for for people listening who uh well there could be there could be two two responses one is uh, you know I'm, i'm a christian i'm feeling very secure in my life as as a follower of jesus and yet i'm i'm immersed in a world where there are other religions. There are, you know, demonic uh, um, voices and pressures and uh, all kinds of things. So, so the first question there is, how, how might I, I suppose, protect myself? You know, we know Paul talks about, you know, the armor of God. And so the, the, I suppose there's that question. But then the other is perhaps, and they're, they're, they're connected, but maybe I'm feeling um, that there's an opening in my life. I'm feeling a constant challenge over one particular sin or I'm listening to a lie and it keeps seem to be embedding in my life, you know, maybe I am suffering a form of, you know, spiritual oppression or demonization. What what can I do with that? You know, what 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 what's the response to that? Okay, so first of all, I just want to say this, anyone listening anywhere in the world, number one, do not be afraid. I'm just going to say this out loud. Every time God shows up, or an angel shows up, or a prophet shows up, they always say the same thing. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is sovereign. Jesus has conquered these things. They're going to burn forever. You know, they're going to be taken out. So just, I want to declare this. This is not to become a theologically, you know, sort of spatty thing, nor is this to inspire fear. Look, Jesus, who's the second person of the Trinity, has brought the Father's kingdom, and he's given us the Spirit. And the same power that empowered Jesus, the local church has. So everyone just breathe. We're going to be fine. Just want to declare that out loud. Jesus is Lord. Mm-hmm. It's just, just so we catch this. To you who want to protect yourselves, I just want to share this with you. You can't. In the sense of we live in a fallen world. There, there is no monastery moment. You can't hide from this stuff. We are called. You can't be salt and light unless you're in rotting meat, because that's where salt was put. And you can't be light unless you're in darkness. So this desire some of us have to monastery ourselves away from all the darkness is not our calling. So we don't run, remember flesh and blood are not our enemy. You know, the person down the street in that other faith, that person who's in another life, they're not our enemy. What owns them is our enemy, but they're not our enemy. So uh, the best way that we can uh, bring light into the world is live a boring Christian life. Take communion, read your Bible, love the poor, attend church. Love the scriptures. Bless those who curse you. Like, I'm quite serious. Like, this is how we bring light into a dark world. Uh, Defend the truth, but don't be a jerk when you do it. Like, we don't need more jerks for Jesus. Be winsome when you defend the faith. You know, like, don't be a donkey online. Stop, Stop going online as a Christian, like, unless you're winsome. Like, just be a follower of Jesus. Put your armor on every day. Realize the world has been dark since Genesis 1, Genesis 3. And till Jesus comes back, it's going to be dark and we get to be light. So I just would say, don't panic, don't fear, walk in the light and, and rejoice that your name is in the Lamb's, in the Lamb's book. Rejoice. You know, it, it's, it's going to be fun. For you who feel you might be demonized or you're like, oh my gosh, that guy just freaked me out because he just gave me a category I've always wanted. But I want to say this to you. Do not fear. There's a reason why you're listening to this. Jesus is a good shepherd. Don't forget he holds two staffs, not one. Psalm 23 is interesting. He has a crook and he's got a rod. And and if you read it carefully, I think they're segregated. One hugs sheep and one kills wolves. And you just need to say to Jesus, look, I think I'm in trouble. I need you to set me free. And actually it might be demonic. I don't know. Could you tell me if it is? And could you start, could you sovereignly begin to bring people to my life to help me? And just cry out to him because I'm stunned so many times in so many churches around the world where someone feels so alone in this and they say, you know, I don't know. And they're in a church. They would never believe this would even be accepted. And suddenly someone walks in and says, you know, I've been praying for you. It's really weird. I've been praying. And then the Lord speaks. And so just like 
be okay. And for the middle group of you that are sort of like angry at what I said, it's okay. First of all, you're going to spend eternity with me. So get used to me now. We're going to, we're going to hang out together. Uh, but, but, but not only that, take time to study this really well. And here's why I want to say this. Don't, don't dismiss what I've said quickly, because if what I've said is true at all, you have an integral part to play in people's freedom, theologically, pastorally, prayerfully, and experientially. And so don't be quick to write this off because it offends your sentiments or offends your theology before you've really done your homework, because actually your homework might matter to your family, to your son, to your daughter, to yourself, to your wife, your church more than you think. We have no time for games anymore. We have no time for games. And so let's be biblical. Let's be really biblical and let the, let, let's let the scriptures actually take us where they go, not where we want them to go because of a theological agenda or, I'll end with this, or fear. If fear drives your theology, you're in trouble. Mm. That's great, John. You know, as you're sharing that, I was just conscious of the fact of you know people listening, and um, just want to say that if if you're listening to this and you know it's impacting you personally and pastorally, uh, don't hesitate to to reach out um, to let us know where you are. Um, there are a lot of great people, books, church communities. Uh, wherever you are, we'd love to help you find a great church community. If you're not part of one, uh, whatever it might be, um, you know, heart's desire today is to serve and to encourage and really do hope this conversation, you know, has uh, encouraged you uh, to prayerfully uh, consider uh, the kingdom we're part of, the glory of Christ. Um, John, you know, as we as we conclude, I, I, I'd love you to pray for us and, and for those of us who are, who are tuning in. Yeah. So in the name of God, the Father who called us before the beginning of time, in the name of God, the Son who lived, died, rose again, and is praying for us at this moment, I, in the name of the Holy Spirit who is mutually possessing all of us right now and connects every Christian on earth, which is so incredible, and even to those who are already in Jesus' presence, in his name we pray this. Number one, Lord, there are people listening to this podcast they are not even Christians. They may be Muslims or Buddhists or Sikhs or witches or agnostics or atheists. And I'm just going to pray along with my friend, Guy, and others like, Lord, open their eyes to their lostness, but show them the beauty of Jesus and show them how he can set them free. Lord, for those who feel oppressed like, um, like a sheep that is being hunted, just right now in Jesus' name, begin to set them free. Help them, guide them, hug them, bring pastors, elders, priests into their life to begin to help them, fellow friends, guard them from Christians who will say stupid things, even though they mean to do it right, just guard them from that. For those who are theologically upset right now, angry or confused, lead them into all truth. And for us who are just trying to be faithful, let us know our gifts, empower us. And we would ask, you know, because I'm in Canada right now, guys in Australia right now, and our countries are very different, but very similar. And I think we would both pray, you know, father and son, uh, we, we beg you to pour out your Holy Spirit on our countries and actually do something we've never seen before. And so just pour out your Spirit. We, we desire more of the Spirit of Christ. Without him, we're totally done as the church. So come, Holy Spirit, we invite you. We, don't, we won't fight you. We just so desperately need you in these days. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray this. Uh, amen. 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 Thank you, John. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Ken. Cheers. Cheers.